to today's episode of Plasma Propulsion and Buoyancy for UFO UAP. This is the voice test. If we pass, I'll be right back. Thank you. All right, let's get started here. Plasma Propulsion and Buoyancy. UFOs and UAPs a thing written for search engines and not a bad uh, thumbnail for me if I say so myself I, I like it uh, <clears throat> but those are the topics uh, not necessarily in that order but we're gonna leave it like that and why are we here why that oh these because it's a couple of buzzwords that I want to get out of my system and um, you know, I'm on Twitter every day and YouTube and looking at all this stuff and commenting. And sometimes I like to put all my comments, you know, cohere my thoughts in either these uh, Twitter moments, which we're going to discuss today. It's linked below. And uh, then make a video out of it so I can, you know, have everything in one place. And not keep repeating myself, which I feel like I'm doing anyway. Because I take the links and repeat those. But this way it's not as repetitious because all I'm doing is a link. And it saves me time. So, off the thumbnail, on to the moment. And here it is, link below. Same title. Written for a search engine, Plasma UFO slash UAP Propulsion and Buoyancy. Glowing Plasma Sheaths. Sheaths. Try that for your diction when you haven't been speaking today. Plasmonic Waveguide, Metasurfaces, and the Role of Buoyancy. See, these are buzz, uh, a couple of buzzwords all came together all around this guy's medium post and tweet joel griffin dodd those of you on ufo twitter and ufo this and that and around the scene you all probably know who he is and he wrote a a nice long blog piece on medium Linked below separately, also linked in the moment. And that set me off. It's a great piece. Everybody read it. Uh, you might even want to stop and st stop listening right now, shut it off, read it, and come back, maybe. If you don't remember it. I, for I didn't remember this because it was only, you know, it was like two months ago almost. So, 
Uh, it's very comprehensive. It's a history. He's he's British, so he knows the British side of things. And now he lives in the United States. I guess he's an American now. I don't know, but. Uh, you know, so he's he's interweaving the stories of both of these countries and their defense establishments and UFOs and several different stories that he wanted to uh, get off his chest. And what that does is trigger other people like me. And, you know, he's here he is talking about plasmas in aerospace development which we're going to get into here. Plasmas in the Modern Era. It's a really nice article. And what else is he talking about? Oh, he goes into, well, can they be alive? Maybe, maybe not. Um, that's, that's almost secondary, but I comment on that too. I couldn't resist, of course. And he goes into the history of Dwight D. Eisenhower and the British seeing things and thinking they're American and vice versa, and TTSA, and Hal Pudolf, and New York Times, and the whole, the whole deal. Nice recap. And it happened to be around the time plasmas were becoming a buzzword again in this community. And... Buoyancy and the other word in there is it is propulsion, of course. Yes, <laughs> oh, yeah, the reason we're here. So, his article set me off. He, it's taken me a few years to get this far, says Joel, but I've finally gotten around to pulling all the pieces together. I know how that feels, buddy. Many wondered why the sudden obsession with high-energy plasmas and electromagnetics. It was the key I needed for your consideration. So he got a key, and his key set off my key, which set off these Twitter moments, which set off this video. Thank you for paying attention. Anyway, and you must be interested too. And I'll try to make it interesting. So... I can't resist. I have to answer Joel with a series of threaded tweets. I have no idea how long I'm going to go. So I say this is 1 over N, which means I'm going to keep going till I'm done. I don't know. So I say to Joel, I also noticed that plasma had suddenly become a buzzword du jour in the last year or so. Because... Uh, the SCU, the Scientific uh, Coalition for, not for UAP, I guess. Uh, that's a group, and so is the UAPX. Uh, the, the SCU studies uh, data and, uh, uh, you know, what's known and stories of this and that around it. And the SCU goes out and tries to find it with their equipment. They have a lot of high-tech um, I guess what they're calling it optoelectronic or you know telescopes or radars and things like that, and they go out to hot spots and record. And uh, both of those groups have been well. There, there's some people that are in both groups, and that guy's been using the word plasma. Well, there's a couple guys, and so other people were picking up on it because they're leaders and authoritative uh, professors of physics and the like, and astrophysics. And so, people pay attention. And I'm one of the types that do does, and so is Joel. And so are you, probably. So, so the buzzword's coming around. It's coming around again. I mean, it's not, it's not a requirement to the topic, in my opinion, but it's part of it. It's like, it might be... Uh, uh, key, you know, it's important to, to consider. So, I go on. In my opinion, these, quote, buoyant plasmas, which I think comes from his article, may be plasmonic waveguide metasurfaces. They're solid, organized, coherent plasma. The particles are trapped in the surface, not like a loose gas. 
if the solid is orb shaped oval ish it could look like a floating sun or ball of light etc because people see these ufos they're spherical orbs whatnot and um they tend to be uh they look like plasma they look like a gas etc and i'm saying yeah they might look like that but they're they're really solid they're it's a solid thing under there but it looks gaseous uh, and uh, it's due to these plasmonic waveguide metasurfaces and, and, and other reasons you know this is just one thread of uh one way which it can go but i just want to throw that out there into the language if you will or the awareness of the for example, the SCU and the UAPX, because we're all out here, we're all interested in each other and what we're doing. But, you know, we're united, if not bickering, but um, we're not all in the same room. So people do their thing and other people watch. So we keep going down here. Uh, and that's all I want to say about that one. So the next tweet is just, it's not, it has nothing to do with, oh yeah, it does have to do with Joel. Uh, it's just, I show a little picture here of kind of what that looks like. Here's the lights going through here. The control of how much light's going this way comes through this sideways, you know, sideways to it. Perpendicular to it. And it kind of, you know, it just gives you a, an intuitive idea of what those surfaces kind of look like. A little bit, maybe. But that's what, that, that's what it is. Click on that and it'll tell you more about those. And uh, the next tweet is in quotes uh, from his article. <clears throat> uh, part of it is, Spinning high energy electromagnetic fields around a Liquid or gaseous metal sounds like an old school way of saying they use EM electromagnetic fields internally controlling and controlled by polaritons to in turn control the plasmons and the resultant buoyancy. It's like if you were from the 1950s and 60s and uh, British uh, military intelligence you'd, and you are eyeballing something like that, that's a damn good guess. I'm not sure who said that right now without looking it up again. But, um, yeah, that's and that's what it is. And, you know, decades later, they can make these things. But uh, that was a good intuitive call there, uh, whoever said that. And anyway, oh, next tweet's kind of cutesy. Uh, aside, how steampunk is gaseous metal? Because that's the expression they used. Uh, yes, they, they did. And I say, it sounds like the extra credit question back in my day of 1970s engineering school. And it, it does, because, you know, how could a metal be gaseous? It doesn't make sense. If we're in our pigeonholed uh, way of thinking, which we are, we always will be to some extent. But uh, back then it would have been like, could such a thing be? For extra credit on your quiz... Could that happen? And I actually think I remember somebody saying that. But it's, it sounds <clears throat> so oddly familiar. Which in Pittsburgh, yeah, you're, if you're in engineering school there like I was, you're going to be talking about metals and metals and metals and metals. At least you used to. And uh, so gaseous metal, whoever saw that. You know, and that's what it appeared to be, and that's what these plasmonic, what do I, I don't know what they call meta plasmonic waveguide meta surfaces might look like. Probably exactly what they look like. Um, next tweet is, uh, well, this is me promoting myself, but it's for the record, I have to do it, okay? I kind of thought of this back in, 2013 okay and I have a whole collection of drawings here I made uh, I came up with these ideas general idea in 2012 and started researching researching you know 
b- being uh, obsessed, in quotes, with it. And I did a lot of sketches, and this one um, has stood the test of time because, well, I kind of visualized a plasma of hydrogen, uh, which has, which is safer, but you know, fairly safe to use because there's no dangerous, uh, not neutron, the new. Uh, you know the thing that's in there between the electron and the and the proton in these neutron, but the new in this case the neutron is the neutron. Okay, never mind. Anyway, so what I'm saying is is you make that stuff into plasma, it's going to absorb more light. Then you take it down energy level. It's an atom. It's it's sucked in that light to explode later. And that's what you're doing here. You're pulling it in here. And that's a drawing I made of this thing a long time ago. And initially thinking about light pumping before I ever heard of a plasmonic uh, meta service. Those are new. Uh, relatively new. And anyway, you would use such a thing. I mean, what is buoyancy? There's the buzzword coming in. Um, this would be a very buoyant thing if you could use it right, that way. That's why, you know, hydrogen gas and hydrogen plasma is not as subject to gravity as liquid hydrogen, or, yeah, hydrogen, or solid, frozen, because the frozen's going to have... You know, it's in place, it's held in place by inertia and gravity. Warm it up a little bit, it's a liquid. Inertia, not as much, isn't uh, affecting it as much, at least here in our gravitational field. It's still wet, it's on the ground. Basically, you know, this, this is all roughly speaking. You hit it again with more energy. Wow, it's a gas now. It's floating around in balloons and things like that. Hmm, huh, how about that? So I thought, well, if you hit it again, it's a plasma. It might absorb even more stuff. You know, this is just uh, me trying to come up with something. And here's what I'm trying to do here is CBMR. I think that means, well, I know what it means, but I put it down there wrong. uh, Cosmic background microwave radiation, which is the temperature of space, which we just talked about in the last video called terahertz. What is it good for? Something like that. And that's what this is. But it's really, it's called CMBR. But I was just learning this stuff and reading about it and teaching myself whatever. And I was trying to figure out how do you pull that through there. Anyway. Enough about that one. Wait a minute. And, yeah, I just threw that in there because it's all going in there. The kitchen sink on plasma, buoyancy, all of it goes in the kitchen sink on that tweet, in this Twitter moment, and in this video. So, continuing. Still talking to Joel. So, quote, party pooping Brits, unquote, that's his phrase. Which I thought was funny, because it's, you know, reading a serious article on the industrial complex and the military. And the fringes of science and the very limits of human knowledge. And he throws in a phrase like party-pooping Brits. It was, it was just funny. So I guess, uh, you know, the British and the Americans were at odds about... Uh, they talk about it, don't talk about it. You know, I don't, I don't know. I forget why they pooped the party this time, but whatever. So I use that to... Oh, they're, they're talking about triangles. And I'm saying, yeah, that makes sense. Plasma balls. One way to, you know, perhaps configure these UFO, UAPs, USOs underwater would be to take... take uh, plasma balls and stick them in a triangle. There's a little square there for extra horsepower, whatever that is. 
Yeah, sure, that works. The black part's absorbent, pulling in all the light, which would also give a slight uh, bubble alone without even pumping it out. So you do both, and you're in a sufficient... You're in your own little world here. You're just passing through ours. But it has nothing to do with dimensions or anything exotic. It's just the light that's in the air or and or in the water and or in space goes in, pumps through, pumped out, pumped around. And, you know, I, I just think it would be more efficient to keep pumping it around because you're using the same wavelengths instead of whatever random ones are here in the sea or in the air. But you can also use the local ones. Very convenient. So, uh, continuing, and I'm just commenting along with his article, a paragraph by paragraph, highlight by highlight. So I say to him, so we're talking a whole network of plasmons, think in terms of every other surface atom, or better. In other words, this whole, sh these whole skins and their little reactor engines sections, um, that's what they're made out of. And uh, I think it's highly possible, can be done by us, can be started now. Uh, it's all based on, you know, uh, common prosaic physics and science. It's nothing that, if I can figure it out, you can. Uh, I only just think inside out, so I see, see things backwards and upside down. But it's nothing more than a, something that's already there. Anyway, we're talking about, I said that one. Well, yeah, you have to kind of read these two together. We're talking whole networks of plasmids. Think in terms of every other surface atom or better. Each one possibly exploding mass equivalent photons repeatedly at 10 to the 15 uh, times per second or more with the little plus there, as opposed to some limited amount of mere stored heat popped just once at a sluggish 10 to the 3. And that's my two cents of why I think my idea is better than a rocket, which it is. But if you put these things in numbers, uh, people that like rockets start understanding it better, if you know what I'm getting at here. And you tell a little story. How the stuff's going through repeatedly. How the photons are mass equivalent. How they're exploding. So that's thrust. Plus they're coming through here five orders of magnitude, zero, zero, that's 10 with 15 zeros. A rocket has three zeros, okay? That's why these little emojis are here of snails, sloths, turtles, things like that. Anyway, I'm just trying to make a point. Imagine the untold numbers of atoms on a surface of the craft acting coherently as nanopumps of mass equivalent light continuously working at 10 to the 15 times a second while a one and done fravor goes home with Goose and Ghost Rider to get more gas. Now, I had just seen the new uh, Top Gun movie. That's where Goose and Ghost Rider come in. And Commander Fravor no disrespect here about him going home and running out of gas. He was a Top Gun guy himself, and we all respect him. And he came out and told his story about chasing a UFO. And it's helped all this uh, conversation considerably, including my own personal agenda and everything else. What's going to happen with it? I don't know. I just have my little area to blabber about. And hopefully it helps the world someday. Anyway, so, yeah, that's 
so I'm just trying to make a point and people can, uh, you know, take it viscerally. Uh, well, you know, how, do, how does this thing, gee, this thing went so fast, it went up and down, it was hanging there, loitering for days. That's how they can do it, you know, with these non-mysterious physics, but some, you know, very uh, rigorous engineering and fabricating and product development left, you know, to do on the table here, okay? You can put it together easily in your mind, but, uh, you know, it's going to take a while in the real world. So no one's going to get any military secrets the other one doesn't already have, not that fast. So that's my opinion. So in the next tweet, I say that's precisely why they seem so otherworldly. I think he used that word in his medium article perhaps they are but it's nothing that cannot done be us in my humble opinion yeah that's i just gave that a humble opinion and i'm trying to go to human beings into not being shaved apes anymore and to move up the ladder here to the uh, aliens if they exist if that's a technology if people aren't seeing things i tend to believe uh they kind of do. I never saw anything, but, you know, I can see how this could be done and what it would mean, so why wouldn't it happen? Mathematically, yeah, it could happen, yeah. So, and people know that it is who have more information than I do, or at least they're saying they know it, etc., and I go on lecturing the world by saying, and not in this million years ahead of his time frame either. Now, or at least starting now, because I, I saw some, you know, I saw a, a YouTube show where somebody was using this million years stuff. If they're a million years ahead of us, then they're pretty slow because they're only 40 years ahead of us. So that's another reason not to be a threat. And if they're going at the rate we've been going lately, in a million years, we really would be an anthill, I think. But, or at least, you know, a monkeys in a tree, you know. They're interesting, but you're not going to go check out all every one of them. Um, so, enough of that lecture. Uh, so, yeah, not in a million years. Sooner. So I'm saying here, oh, I start really lecturing here, yeah. So unleashing this superior energy technology is probably not a bad idea to consider for the MIC, that's Military Industrial Complex, spooks, pardon me, <clears throat> still sitting on it with certain laptops despite all the economy killing Earth has a fever, existential hysteria going on. That's a little political comment. The news of that day, I remember that day, that there was, uh, you know, that's just my opinion, okay? Nonsense happening in the news. Everybody wins, right? That's a quote from his uh, article about, you know, what if this is free energy and they're, the governments are sitting on it in a cabal with certain private companies. Well, you know, they're trying to act in our best interests. But more and more, people don't, you know, they trust that less and less. Let's put it that way, especially since the Cold War. So I say, give me a break with these clowns. I mean, I won't go on further about that right now. Okay, back to the point. Good. I was getting to the point then and now. On top of producing buoyancy-based propulsion, if a thing's floating, is it propelling? Hmm, I don't know, that's a tough one. I'm saying, well, basically, you know, under, yeah, if you dig down deeper under the buoyancy word, which a lot of people like to stop at, and they like to stop the word density and things like that, just go down one more level. Well, why is it buoyant? Why is it have density? Uh, the reason is that the energy levels are higher because of light passing, you know, absorbed, which allows more to pass through, which allows more to be pumped, 
where it handle, which you could also call exploded because a giant photon comes in, shrinks into a little atom, 6,000 times smaller than blows out. The other side, that's thrust. I, you know, I think you can call that thrust because it's mass equivalent. It's a tiny thrust compared to a tiny piece of mass, but it's also happening in an extremely dense area. Like I said, atom by atom on the surface. Or a little waveguide opening by little waveguide opening on the surface. Or sub-wavelength, even smaller. So it's tiny stuff, but it's happening in such great numbers and at such great speeds that it makes up for being tiny. And that's why it's quiet, and that's why it's just, you know, it's just hanging there. And that's why it's fast, and that's why this and that. No inertia, no gravity. It isn't magic. It's a flipping balloon, jacked up balloon, okay? That's one way of, of looking at it. So, okay, back to the point, like I was saying. On top of the... Bu 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 on top of the buoyancy produced propulsion, in quotes, these plasmonic metasurfaces, surfaces, I guess I uh, doubled myself there, can be used for sensing, imaging, and computing too. And it can do, a, I, I, I started making a little list. These things do multiple things. So you have a layer for this, a layer for that. Sometimes this layer can be used for what that layer is 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 too. They switch around, uh, you know, in theory, in theory, in theory. Which, you know, if you think about it, yeah, sure. Now, how are you going to optimize that? That's where you need your, your uh, quantum photonic computers to actually out-design the Palladians or whatever. Yeah, eventually, yeah, sure, yeah, okay. You're going to get one more... 13 zero percentage points uh, toward the speed of light with it. But how about right, you know, let's focus on right now and just, you know, get the general principle done first, all right? Nice having such all-in-one capabilities. That's what I'm saying here. There, I, I should have my little list on my desk here while I'm recording, but I don't have it because I just started compiling it. Four... This, I've been working on this. Those of you deeply into this know what this is. I'm boiling down hours of hot air into one hour of concise stuff. Anyway, uh, nice having such all in one capabilities. Yeah, so, you know, you start out walking and learn to run, etc., and so forth. Next tweet. Additionally, the ability to, quote, refract or absorb incident radar beams, unquote, that must have been, that's from that article, it sounds like it. Yes, yeah, it is. And, quote, spoofing, unquote, capabilities are inherent. Because they're shooting radar at the thing, the thingy, thing eats it. It pumps it through its skin and maybe shoots it right back at you. It doesn't, that's not going to... It, it doesn't make it's like splashing water on a submarine to see if it's uh, see what it looks like. You know, it's gonna suck it in and spray it back out at you, or it's gonna use a propeller and just push it at you. So, I mean, don't be insulted if they jam your radars by accident. Uh, so yes, I say it's simply just one more incidental layered functionality with those other ones on the list that I'm going to have all in one tweet at one point. So, yeah, I keep on going here and say, I'll, I'll push people toward this website of mine, this webpage, about the five observables, which is spoofing and radar jamming. That's one of the problems they have and is listed officially and etc. So I wrote an article on why they're, quote, the Five utterly predictables, a smart alecky, attention getting way, and also true way of looking at the same thing. If you buy my 
story, which, of course, I do. So read that in your spare time. That's fun. It's short. It's short, and I think some of it's funny. But below harding along here, the next tweet, the possible injuries around this stuff is a layered downside for now. Layered is a poorly trying to be cute with words, but this was around the time uh, there was a lot of people talking about, um, you know, people get near these uh, UFOs and they get severely injured with, uh, you know, radiation burns and brain damage, and it's not pleasant. So that was a hot topic uh, during that week, and that's kind of a smart alecky joke there about that which is off topic. But if you were following it, you might uh, see the connection. So the next tweet is just a picture of a of a plasmonic wave guy. Well, what's it look like? You know, it looks like that. You know, if you, if you had a x-ray vision or whatever, you'd see it looking like that, you know. Scientific papers galore on that. <clears throat> and I look at them every day and post them on Twitter. So you should follow me there if you like this stuff. Pardon me, I'm going to take a sip here. Now, next tweet is... Um, I start lecturing again. Oh, <clears throat> about... Uh, Plasma and buoyancy and stuff like that. See, when I see him use that word and it's passed on from, I don't know, I forget where it came from exactly in this article, you know, military people. Um, military industrial complex, you know. These people have more authority than me to use that word in the eyes of the beholder, at least so far. Because buoyancy is... Well, as expressed in this beautiful artwork of mine here, when I first start talking about this online, people would uh, say, ah, it's just buoyancy, which, you know, it is, yeah, but I'm just saying you can, en you can enhance it, you can optimize it, you can, it's like any other material property. I mean, people think nothing of like, yeah, this steel is harder than diamond, or this diamond is harder than whatever, Titanium, that's not right though, but there are certain, certain graphenes are harder than diamond uh, configurations. But, but, what does that have to do with it? Oh, so I'm saying, I'm saying, you know, buoyancy, I believe, can be and should be also optimized and tinkered with and toyed with. And these metasurfaces and metamaterials and that stuff, that's how you do it. Think of a loose gas in a balloon. Well, that's buoyant. People think that's all it's ever going to do. No, I don't think so. Take each, each atom in that gaseous atom out one by one, one by, stick it on a metal, quoting loosely here. Now you have a metal that's... Uh, or, you know, a solid thing that is buoyant, or more buoyant than it was. And you keep, you know, you stimulate that atom, and you make it absorb from this side, and emit from that side, and etc. and so forth. Do it this fat quickly in this direction, and uh, anyway, that's where we're going here. But he mentions... He also mentions something about the hypersonics, which is another big topic lately around all this stuff. Because that stuff is kind of developed, and our enemies and have this stuff, and we do too, and you know that's what they're working on now, which you can't blame them. They're not going to drop everything for this yet, but they should be on the side. Uh, hint. Uh, and they share some of these hypersonics. Uh, 
strategies they you they're using or there's talk of use or etc they're close to this at least one a aspect of what I'm saying they already know or they've noticed and I'm saying well if you notice that well notice more because there's a hell of a lot more to it um, talking about hypersonics continuing they do seem to be starting to understand that breaking up the air around the missiles and the like decreases friction or drag. Now I'm putting it in standardized, uh, oh, I call them thrust monkeys sometimes. But, you know, aer aeronautics engineering, which is, you know, I barely understood it, you know, the basic level to pass the test on that. I, but yes, I have to make fun of them sometimes because of, to get attention, sadly, anyway. But they are right about this. They have noticed this, and I'm saying just keep noticing more. It's why a, buoyant, a sufficient buoyant light bubble mitigating gravity will also mitigate inertia. So I'm saying, okay. You're getting the general idea using your buzzwords, drag and friction. Well, keep digging. That's all I ask. I know you are, I hope. <clears throat> I'm going to keep going. Alien scientists... Oops. Skipped alien. Yeah. Guy, Leek Mirabu. He's not his guy. He's the guy he brought to my attention. I never heard about this stuff apparently knew about this and was using lasers to do something with it before it went hush-hush. In other words, they use light to either break up the air. I, I, I use it to, as a buffer. I think of it more that way. But, but if you were putting lasers on the front of these things, uh, these hypersonic missiles, you're going to break up the air. You're going to loosen it up, soften it up. Um... I, I say put a light buffer around it because it's slip. You know the the word I use is slippery. You go through that air, you'll slip through that air. What you're doing by breaking it up with lasers, you're sliding through it. You know you're, you're getting the right idea, but it's you're still running into um, you know ionized air. It's still somewhat air. It's, you're still going to get drag and and the other thing from it. Let's drag and friction. I don't want any friction. That's why I cover my thing with a slippery light bubble. Anyway. Uh, Leek Marabou. Yeah, he, he was... Uh, I guess he was doing research on it and then it all went uh, quiet. Probably because they knew it was right. Anyway. Uh, the next tweet is about alien scientist who was on my mind and he also, he's been talking about these plasmon and polariton metasurfaces generally as well and has been for years and he talks about them in a more general sense and I'm, I'm not saying he's endorsing what I'm saying what I am saying is when he's talking about them I'm paying attention and listening and it's helping me it has helped me a little bit with this well, more than a little bit on on this entire thread, a lot. But uh, we covered that in the last video. So here's the next tweet: is as to the question of whether plasma can be living, I tend to doubt it, but leave that to God. But I see how it could certainly be seem to be made intelligent. In other words, these these surfaces on these things, you know, they're their computer, the computer's function and is built right into the thing. It's like a souped-up Roomba floor sweeper, you know. It gets the input, acts on it, and sees how its actions uh, play out and correct itself accordingly, intelligent. That's why a cat can steer it the other way. Anyway... Uh, yeah, living, I don't know, that's, people say that they, that, uh, these things seem sentient. Yeah, they're moving faster than you can blink your eyes, so yeah, they kind of, you know, 
even if it's a computer, it could seem that way. But that's a sigh. I had to throw in that comment. Anyway, the next tweet is me lecturing the world again. Plasmonic waveguide metasurfaces can be developed privately, possibly well behind the curve, the MIC, the military curve, but so what? In other words, if they know about it one way or the other and have been working on it, that doesn't stop the private sector from developing these things, which would be nice in an energy crisis with the gas prices and all, and the grocery prices are affected by all this. We all know that. Come on. So, wouldn't it be nice if certain things moved by themselves were a lot easier if you're suddenly your Tahoe truck weighs as much as a 2002 uh, Subaru Forester, okay? You think your gas bill would go down from 13 miles a gallon to 26 or whatever it is? Yeah. Now do the diesel trucks, etc. Plane airplanes. Whatever. Anyway. With the overreaching feds trying to use the we pay for it excuse. That must have been in the news that day. To, for example, mac, uh, mandate vaccines. I don't expect them to relent here no matter the cri climate crisis. Yeah, that day had a bunch of idiotic news going on. So let's just skip that one. These scientists speaking out recently are on federal dollar leashes and buried in NDAs. I don't expect much from that corner soon, just breadcrumbs, and this is, I played this elsewhere. Um, that's a tweet there, I won't play it again. It's Hal Putoff saying he doesn't expect the deep state to, uh, well, I can use it, fair use, I'll claim fair use, I, I don't think, I think I used it before and no one complained, so... Let's go on. Let's listen to what he has to say here again one more time because it does drive that point home about uh, privatizing this stuff and doing it, at least starting it. you got to make an effort to do anything. From my uh, contacts and so on, uh, I, I think although there will be enough information coming out to finally lay to rest, that this is not a tinfoil hat subject and there's reality to it. And uh, <clears throat> the government is making a concerted effort to, to uh, learn more about it. Um, <clears throat> I think any truly deep state increase knowledge is likely not to come out. I don't see all the barriers falling understand okay From my understood thank you and finally winding down here yeah so that's there because just to drive that point of home again that you know we all know that they're going to uh keep sitting on this stuff if it's even there so why not go uh Go on what you know. They're doing their thing. We can do ours. Pardon me. I'm <clears throat> kind of... Excuse me. <clears throat> Finishing up, finally. Joel Dowd uh, closes his medium post with Columbo which I grew up with. And for a while, somebody nicknamed me that. I've been trying to remember who called me that because he has a glass eye and I have a one eye is weaker than the other. So it's uh, it looks cross sometimes. It's not, but it, you know, wander. It will wander, yes. So I kind of make that face. I guess I'm 
quizzical. I used to wear trench coats like that and a tie and white shirt and all that. But I can't, for the life of me, I can't remember who called me that. It was a little nickname in some circle somewhere at some point. And uh, his show's been back on TV. I've been watching it too. Peter Falk as Columbo. So, just one more thing, Mr. Dodd, before I forget. That was his line. He was a detective. He would always throw in that one last question. And uh, I guess that's what I'm doing here. What am I doing? No, I'm not throwing in a question, just a statement. I'm saying here to these SCU and UAP guys, I'm saying, you know, I'm just trying to tag them on this thing anyway, just just so they know about this stuff, which I'm sure they can figure out. I just never, never heard them mention it or anything. Um, uh, well, I tell them, so what do I do? I link them to a list of a bunch of tweets I did on this stuff. And uh, I don't know why, self-promotion of some sort. Any guys, pay attention over here. If you, you know, if you're into this plasma thing, you might want to see this too, for your own good. That's me, Mister Helpful here. So winding up, I do that and I sign off and I say, Joel, thanks for writing this. I've been meaning to do a plasma thread for a while. Your article finally induced it. Like his article was induced by something. It was like two people getting getting out of you know getting something out off their desk, as it were. Uh, uh, induced by other people. So thanks again to Joel for this, and for you all for listening. And watch out for this. I'll be doing this someday. Still working on it. I'll get back to it. I had to do two, a couple of videos. I don't know I haven't been talking about it since May. So I want to get to it. You know, I get uh, anxious and itchy to say these things out loud instead of just on Twitter. So when I do this, I'll start babbling more on YouTube. I've been invited on shows and things like that. And I do want to, I want to do all that stuff. But first I have to do what I have to do. And then it's conquer the great white whale of doing an APEC presentation. If you don't know who that is, I thought I had, yeah, here, here it is. Look for this in the links below and elsewhere on YouTube. And what else? I think that's it. I think we're there. I think we're done here. And I take a break and come back and give you a little musical outro of entertainment. Thanks, folks. <laughs>